Hello again. Tonight we're going to talk about gravity wave to optical correlation. It's like how, how you dovetail these two things to see if they're happening at the same time or if they're related. So you probably heard of gravity waves or gravitational waves. We have uh, a few observatories around the planet, um, Virgo and LIGO and places like that. But we also have the um, deep space uh, pulsar timing array, where when the fabric of space time is stretched or squeezed, the um, accuracy of a pulsar's pulse timing changes by a very small amount. So we can detect gravity waves. And there is currently a postulation that there's a background gravity wave, just like there's a background microwave. And so we're looking for gravity waves, what causes them, when they occur. And now the question's been asked, when gravity waves occur, when these gravitational wave events occur, is there anything else to look at at roughly the same time? And their first thought was, um, sure, optically. But the gravity wave observatories are very coarse at pointing. So, hey, we just had a gravity wave. Where was it? It's over in this part of the sky. Could you narrow it down? Because the area that you're telling me it's in is about 400 times the area of a full moon. It's in the ballpark over there. I'm telling you, it's not over here, and it's not up here, and it's not down there. It's over there. So they needed a, a better way to see the area of the sky and break it down from its uh, 78.5 square degrees down to something smaller. So the European Southern Observatory has been working with um, optical telescopes, and they've got this uh, prototype that they had down in South Africa, and it seemed to be good. It had about... Uh, three and a half degrees field of view, you know, three, three degrees by three degrees, basically that chunk. And if you think about the moon, the moon's a half a degree. So half a degree to three, three and a half degrees, that's a pretty large expansion. But when you're dealing with 78 degrees on a side from the gravity wave detectors, you've got to be looking at that area of the space all the time in order to, to see what's going on. But if you want to look at an even tighter area of sky, um, use Earth-sized, very long baseline array observing in radio, because then you can look down at, uh, you can look at very tiny portions of an arc second. So I would say, you know, once they get the gravity wave and then they get the optical, move over to radio and get a really good look at it. So why would they want to correlate these two observations? And you can see there the, the red letters are gravity and wavelength, G for gravity and lambda for wavelength. So can an optical observation more precisely locate the source of the gravity wave event? Do optical events happen at all in correlation with gravity waves? Maybe they only are doing energetic stuff. Um, if they are optical, is there a brightness curve? Do they start out dim, get brighter, and then dim down? If so, like what's the overlap with the gravity wave event? How bright do they get? How long will they last? All those kinds of things. And then it's the ordering. It's, it's the old chicken and an egg. Which came first, the gravity wave event or the optical event? So you've got all these questions that they want to have answered. But since gravity wave, big part of sky, optical, smaller part of the sky, you've got to be looking at a lot of different places in the sky which requires you to store huge volumes of observational data for optical observing and store it for a while so that when the gravity wave event happens, you can go back and look at the data retrospectively and see if there's anything in that part of the sky that looks unusually bright. But that also requires um, you know, petabytes of optical storage data. And when you say, we had a gravity wave over in that part of the sky. Okay, take all the observations from that, you know, 78.5 by 78.5 square degrees, put a flag on it not to be overwritten in tomorrow's observations. So they have to have the spare data storage space to keep the data. So the European Southern Observatory has put together this thing called the Black Gem Program. Black as in dark sky and gem as in German equatorial now. So... Um, the individual telescopes look like the one that I showed you earlier, and they sit inside of three clamshell domes in South America, high atop a desert plateau. 
the domes don't move anywhere. They're, they're fixed in place. And the center column of the dome is actually uh, physically isolated from the pier that the telescope is mounted on. So if there's any shaking in the ground due to wind hitting the dome, it won't affect the positioning of the telescope. So they can shoot very wide fields, very stably. The, uh, the original prototype in uh, South Africa is still there, but it's now associated with a uh, radio observatory. So the individual telescopes, um, they're a modified form of a uh, dahl Kirkman type re reflector telescope. That just means that the primary mirror is elliptical. It's not spherical, it's not parabolic, it's elliptical. And that the secondary mirror is spherical. And it has a couple of extra lenses before the secondary to further tighten in the, uh, the fringes to, to be able to see a wide field more closely and sharply. Um, each one of the observatories has its own dedicated dome and they're like a clamshell. They'll open all the way to 180 degrees so that the telescope can look at anything in the sky above it. The individual imagers, and there's one imager per telescope, is 10,500 by 10,500 pixels or 110 megapixels. And the individual pixels are nine microns in size, which as a personal telescope would be excellent. But for scanning a large part of the sky, um, they're only going to get 2.5 degrees by 2.5 degrees out of it. So they're going to have to create every evening like a pattern of the sky to catch you know, 78 degrees by 78 degrees in that area in case there's a gravity wave event. And because they're not sure what type of optical event it will be, they had to provide it with uh, basically the full boatload of color filters. So they can capture 440 nanometers to 720 nanometers. 440 is close to UV and 720 is into invisible infrared. The telescopes themselves are not really controlled by local personnel. There's local technicians in South America to maintain them and, and fix things, but they're, act, they're actually operated remotely in, uh, by Radbund and uh, in the Netherlands over in Europe. And this is actually a joint project. Like, where did they get the money to do all this stuff? Um, three things, the university in the Netherlands, a research group in the Netherlands, and uh, another university in Belgium. So I mentioned the colored filters. For those not familiar with it, when it was referring to Sloan and then letters to mean the filters, uh, this is a little bit of a background information. When you just see those letters, they don't have a constant for their wavelength. The bands do overlap. There's no gaps between them. But uh, I found it interesting that in the uh, in 1980s, the U.S. Air Force had a definition for these letters as to what wavelength they were associated with, their center line was. And then when the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, or SDSS, came about, they started out with a particular value. And as the particular filters were dye filters, as in they're just a dye coating, they oxidized. And when they oxidized, every time they did an update, like SDSS, SDSS2, SDSS3, they had to come out with new values for what the filter's center lines were. And you could see that they progressively moved. So the original Air Force ones for ultraviolet was 365. And then the first SDSS was 354.3. And now it's kind of oxidized a bit. And now it's moved up to 355. But that's not to say they all move in that same direction. The green one moved from 477 to 468. So instead of Moving up, it moved down. So they have to periodically reevaluate all of the uh, Sloan filters to see what are they now. But suffice it to say that these black gem telescopes um, are going to be able to see from ultraviolet uh, into um, the part of infrared that's not human visible. So they'll be able to see whatever light does make its appearance. So why would we have to do this? We, can't we just like go back and look at it later? Well, these events don't last a long time. Um, a gravity wave event might last um, you know, 1.1 seconds or a fraction of a second. Um, 
an optical event involving things like supernovas or hypernovas, those can last several days to the better part of a month. So getting the two events overlap where you can see, I had a gravity wave, and here's the optical event that happened at roughly the same time, or before it or after it, you have to think about, okay, which one do I observe first? Which one do I detect first? Well, we don't really have a good handle on exactly when these things occur. We have ballparks, uh, an optical like a nova. We know a nova is coming because we can roughly tell the, the age of a star. But in the case of a gravity wave event, if it happens to be two black holes merging and they're, they're, the black holes are not feeding and they're not um, supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies, we literally cannot see them until the event happens. So they just happen. And in the case of the optical ones, we've got some clue, but still, we're not down to, it's going to happen at 7.30 tonight kind of thing. So wh which do we look for? Well, gravity wave events, we know we don't know where they come from. They're just, they happen when they happen. So gravity wave detectors pretty much have to operate uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year as the Earth rotates. And gravity waves can actually come, uh, can occur during the daytime. And they can also occur up through the Earth, not necessarily from the from above the Earth down. So use gravity wave detection uh, as the trigger event, and then go look for optical stuff. But they can't have um, normal field of view optical telescopes dedicated to looking at the entire sky, because first of all, they only look at night; they don't look in the daytime. And secondly, uh, they can be on the other side of the Earth at the time, or at the poles. So each telescope you're going to dedicate needs to have several degrees field of view. Here's something surprising. How many people knew that the Unicode character set that computers use actually have characters, letters for a chicken and an egg? I, when I went, whenever I go looking for graphics, that is the graphics that don't have any cost associated with them because they're just freely available computer fonts. So the chicken and the egg you see here are the uh, chicken and egg characters from the Unicode uh, font set. So anyway, uh, gravity wave events are you know 24 by 365 and can come up through the Earth. They can occur daytime, nighttime, clouds, rain, snow. Gravity waves happen when they happen. The optical events, you have, a, have to have a dark, good sky to see them and a wide field, so you're not just staring at one spot of the sky. Take a picture, take a picture, take a picture, and you do that over a mosaic, and then you just repeat it all night long, and then you give one of the other three telescopes a different part of the sky to look at, and the third telescope a different part of the sky to look at, and hopefully you're covering all the interesting parts of the sky where gravity wave events might have occurred. So it's a bit hit or miss. So we start out by detecting the gravity wave event, we determine the, the course location of where the event occurred. We contact, like Black Jim, the optical folks. We let them know it occurred. We give them the course location. If they have not been observing in that area, uh, that's unlucky because they don't have any existing observational data. But that night, they'll start looking in that area. And hopefully, the optical part of the gravity wave event hasn't already gone away by then, but hit or miss. Um, if they have been looking in that part of the sky, then they can flag all those stored observations as don't overwrite these. We're going to come back and look at them later. How much longer? Don't know. So just, just hang on to them until you're, you're pinched for storage. But my thought is, if you're going to have this mechanism for a gravity wave event occurred and we want to correlate it with other events, don't be shy. Let others know. They won't be looking at the area of the sky that you're looking at. Their instruments are probably much narrower field than um, the Black Gem telescopes. But have them look anyway. Maybe maybe they're close to the target. Maybe if they talk amongst themselves, so to speak, you might find that a gravity wave event has optical, infrared, radio, X-ray, and gamma all at the same time, or slightly overlapped or slightly skewed, one arriving before the other. E even look for it as neutrinos. But uh, I think the biggest audience to announce, hey, look for it. Do you already have it? Have you captured it? Is the amateur astronomy community. 
Remember, amateurs are the ones that find the most comets, meteors, asteroids, all those kinds of things, because they're always looking up and they always have their telescope doing things and they might have captured something. But uh, make it an all observing instrument event. This I found interesting as kind of a side project, the, um, the original prototype Black Gem Telescope uh, in South Africa has been uh, aligned and is observing with the um, um, Meerkat uh, portion of the square kilometer array. So you have uh, the Meerkat radio telescope array, which is like 60 some odd radio telescopes. And then where they're focused, the um, Meerlicht or the Black Gem prototype, that radio telescope that optical telescope is pointed where the radio telescope array is pointed, linking the, it happened in this band, that it also happened in that band. Now, here's the shortcoming, or as I say, the rub. The degrees field of view and the coverage we have for gravity wave observatories is many times wider than our dedicated purpose wide field optical telescopes with 110 megapixel imagers. So hopefully some of the parts of the sky they've already viewed in previous nights, approximating when the gravity wave event occurred. They're already looking at that part of the sky and go back and look at it, or they have time available this night and the optical event wasn't so short lived that they can't find it. This is why instead of just three telescopes, they want 15 to cover more of the sky, but covering more of the sky only at night. Radio telescopes can look at the sky in the daytime. Um, neutrino telescopes can look at the sky 24-7 and can detect neutrinos coming up through the Earth or coming down from the sky. So get everybody involved and get the amateurs involved because they're probably over the entire planet looking at far more degrees of sky, but it's patchy. Lots of people looking at the Orion constellation for the Orion Nebula, so to speak, but not too many people looking at uh, other constellations like telescopium which might uh, be where the event occurs and uh, remember the the amateurs only look at night and they only look when the weather is good so it'll be a bit of hit or hit or miss but if, if you're already recognizing that the area of sky you're looking for is much larger than the field of view of the telescopes you're using to look um, you've, you've already got something to deal with so in conclusion, um, there's a strong potential for optical events or even higher energy events to occur when these gravitational wave events occur. Um, but you can't conclusively say that until you have observational data that overlaps the gravity wave event with the optical observations. But given that the gravity wave detection is a very large part of the sky and the optical is a very much smaller part of the sky, you've got to always be looking and recording and hang on to the data for a while so that you can come back and look at it later. But I think ultimately the best way to continue to look at the sky for all things correlated is more kinds of telescopes, lots more of them. And, you know, they don't have to all be billion dollar telescopes. They can be much, much cheaper down to the, you know, if universities have 20 to $50,000 that they can dedicate for various things, then, Maybe having a consortium of universities, they do exist in the infrared community, having a consortium of universities uh, looking at various parts of the sky, not the same parts of the sky, but different parts of the sky, uh, might be something worthwhile taking a look at. And lots of links to things, a whole, whole lot of stuff related to the Black Gem Project and all of the partners and universities and stuff. And for those not familiar with La Silla Observatory in South America, link to that. And then when you're like, what, what is a Dahl Kirkman Reflector Telescope? Information on that. Um, the Southern African Astronomical Observatory, the Meerkat, part of the Square Kilometer Array. And um, for those not that familiar with it, the LIGO and Virgo Gravity Wave Observatory. And if you want to know about radio astronomy, we have three major um, radio telescopes and arrays that the U.S. 
National Science Foundation's National Radio Astronom Astronomical Observatory um, manages. That's Green Bank in West Virginia. Uh, in the Southwest, the Very Large Array. In South America, the Alma Microwave Array. And then what is that very long baseline interferometry, the VLBI, the planet size radio telescope? And then for some high energy stuff, the uh, Chandra X-ray and the Fermi uh, Gamma Ray telescopes. And then our latest space telescope, the Euclid. What the Sloan Digital Sky Survey is. And how did I figure out, given the nanometers wavelength of the particular filters, what color that was? Well, somebody's actually posted an app, an app to Wolfram Alpha that allows you to key in the nanometers of wavelength and it will pop up and go, uh, here's an approximation of that color. And if it's not human visible, it'll just show a little black square. Okay, so I knew tonight's topic would not be uh, that long, but I wanted something that was more astronomy related rather than postulations or projects or, or you know, that kind of stuff. Um, just a change of pace. But I knew it wasn't going to take that long. So comments, questions? Okay, uh, hearing nothing, uh, I'll stop sharing. And I'll remove myself from being pinned. And I'll stop recording.